Today's video is brought to you by Bright Sellers. More on them in just a bit. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon, and what happens here is uh, one of my writers today, George, has written me a script on the North Hollywood shootout. This is one of those ones that I feel like I definitely have heard about. I definitely feel like once we get into it, I'm going to know something about this. Uh, but I, and I also feel it's one of those ones where the entire American audience, which is the majority of people who listen to this show, is going to be like, Simon, how do you not know about this? And I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of like we recently did one about Derek Bird, which was a mass shooting which occurred in the UK. And uh, I'd ask you, did, did any of you hear about that one? Because uh, doesn't always cross the pond. Anyway, uh, this is an absolute beast of an episode today. I uh, see I've got 24 pages. That's right. a lot of trees. So, uh, yeah. That's heavy. We're going to be here for a while, I guess it's a bit of a deep dive, so thank you to George, who uh, obviously put a ton of research into this one. And uh... Jen? You forgot to... I, well, I'm looking forward to it, I hope you are as well. The format of the show, if you're new, just let me explain very briefly, is I've not read this before, we're going to explore it together. I say this every time, but you know, new people listen to the show. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I see those uh, viewer numbers increase on YouTube and the listener numbers increase on podcast, and I love that. Thank you for being here. Let's go. American bank robbery was experiencing something of a renaissance during the 1990s and was hitting levels of both quantity and ferocity not seen since the high points, or low point depending on your perspective, of John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson's robberies in the 1930s. The number of bank robberies in America rose from an apparently modest figure of 850 a year in 1975 up to 3,500 a year in 1985, which continued to increase to a shocking 9,388 in 1991, equivalent to one bank robbery every 16 minutes every day of every week of the year. That's absolutely mental. I mean, it's the American way, right? We all want more. I know America's a big place, but holy shit, guys. Every 16 minutes? That's, I mean, it says two things. Banks should be more secure. <laughs> and also, why are people so desperate that they have to rob banks? I mean, uh, and also greedy. Because it's not, I feel like there are crimes of desperation, like theft and petty crimes. And then there's bank robbery, and it's like, ah, if you're robbing a bank, I feel that's less desperation and more greed because you're hoping to get away with a lot of money and uh, go live on an island or some shit like that because it's a pretty big crime. Um, anyway, and I also feel like bank robbery is one of those ones where it's like, it, you get a spate of uh, not just bank robberies like in the 90s and 80s or whatever, but um, movies as well. Good afternoon, this is about a gang. I swear there'll be like a time where every movie, like half the movies in the cinema are bank robber movies or like heist movies and you're like, yes, I love it. And then years will go by. Like recently I've seen, I saw like three, two or three end of the world movies, like asteroids hitting the earth movie. Uh, movies, and it felt like we were back with uh, Deep Impact and Armageddon in like 97 or whatever. Um, it's weird that these things all come round at, at, at a certain time. It's a documentary. It's all really happening. Now, I hate to take a proverbial dump in your cornflakes, dear viewers. Holy sh**, George. <laughs> That's an image. Uh, but you might be disappointed to know that not every robbery within this vastly inflated figure was a bold, daring, or exciting heist worthy of immortalization in a classic movie such as Heat or Ocean's Eleven. In fact, they tended to be more mundane affairs, netting an average take of $6,559. Oh, okay. Wait. I mean, I look, I don't want to come across as out of touch because $6,559 is a lot of money. You could buy a lot of shit with $6,000, uh, especially in the 80s, where it's got to be like double or triple today. It's no small amount of money. Don't want to seem out of touch. But what is the punishment for robbing banks? I'm fairly sure it's a lot higher than just like, I don't know, grabbing someone's purse or shoplifting or stuff like that. And I really, how long would it take you to shoplift six grand's worth of stuff? I mean, it would take a while but not as long as a prison sentence for robbery. And also the police are going to be way more motivated to solve like the big robbery of the bank rather than, I don't know, you stealing some shit from Curry's. Curry's is a, an electronic store in the UK, like uh, Best Buy, but a bit shitter. We had Best Buy in the UK for a while and it was great. It was like, look at this great electronic store that's better than our electronic stores. And then for some reason it didn't succeed. And I'm like, how? <laughs> it was better. 
It was the best. Furthermore, within the 9,388 bank robberies that occurred in 1991, shots were fired in 134 of the robberies. Three of the robberies involved explosive devices. 132 people were injured, 27 killed, and 135 people were taken hostage. Oh my god. Okay, actually, that's not too bad. 9,338 robberies and shots were fired in only 134 of them, which implies super compliance people being robbed. And I've mentioned this story a million times, but just for the new people, when I worked at a store when I was a kid, they, were, they specifically said, if someone comes in and robs you, just give them what the f they want. That's called courage. Don't be pressing that alarm button under the till until they're gone, because we'd rather have you alive than no money left in the till. Because it's a giant supermarket, <laughs> and like it gets a long way up the chain of command before someone actually minds that you've been robbed. By this point, after hearing that underwhelming declaration, I suspect your mice are drifting towards the next video in disappointment, but stop, don't be disappointed. Drag that mouse away from the next video, smash that like and subscribe button on route, and make sure yourself and make yourself comfortable for the next hour or so. Just because most robberies of the period have been mundane affairs, it doesn't mean that they all were. And it is one such robbery that we're looking at today. I feel like we're really leaving out the podcast listeners with that description. Sorry, podcast listeners. Hey, let me give you a plug as not a plug. But why don't you leave me a review? <laughs> and it's not just any bank robbery that we're looking at today, ladies and gentlemen. Today's episode isn't a simple post office sawn off shotgun stick up. Au contraire. We at the Casual Criminalist aspire to bring you our much-loved audience nothing but the most exciting and biggest of heists written by the most handsome of writers in all of the internets. Today, we examine a most special and extreme case indeed. Uh, George, I feel like uh, and most handsomest of presenters, excuse me. Today, we'll travel back to the morning of February the 28th, 1997 in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> I used to pronounce Los Angeles, Los Angeles because that's how British people say it. And I t everyone was like, ha ha, how British people say Los Angeles. Ha ha, Los Angeles, please. And so I started saying it the American way because it's an American city and that felt appropriate. And it, 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 it's better, isn't it? Los Angeles, now it sounds weird to me. And I get it, Americans. When Officer Lauren Farrell, a veteran of the Los Angeles Police Department and his partner, Officer Martin Perello, have just clocked on for the day. And as always, they're hoping for a pleasant, and safe shift. The pair are cruising down Laurel Canyon Boulevard in North Hollywood, gossiping about the Anaheim Ducks versus the Los Angeles Kings hockey game a week prior when Officer Farrell, who had been keeping his eyes and ears on the street, suddenly requests his partner in command of the squad car to slow down. Whitfield's entire demeanor shifts suddenly, his calm, jovial placidity replaced with alertness and inquisitive caution as adrenaline floods his system. He continues peering ahead at a white sedan parked by the Bank of America branch just a couple of hundred yards beyond them. Stop the car! He screams as he finally realizes what he's seeing. Over there, it's a robbery at the bank. He says, poking Officer Perello, gesturing wildly at the bank in front of them. Perello does as instructed and glances ahead in the direction that Farrell is pointing. He almost misses it, but is able to focus his vision fast enough to just be able to catch a most clear image. A man entering the bank with a gun. They report a 2-11 robbery in progress and set up an ambush position with their police cruiser as instructed. A few minutes pass and the pair are confident of a quick and peaceful resolution. They're talented, trained professionals who believe they have all the training and experience they need to handle what was by now a routine situation. That's so intense. I, I hope there's no point in my life where doing this sort of is. And I, you know, I admire people who can go out and do that every day because I... And there's so many jobs that I see, and I, I mean, I don't, I, it's not like I feel bad for what I do, like not being out there doing one of these jobs that helps people. But I mean, maybe a little bit, but it is like, I could, it would be so hard to do this every day. And like, I don't know, also like medical professions as well, or firemen or all of these stuff. They're out there kind of, I mean, medicine less, but like firemen, police, military, all of this stuff, putting their lives at risk for something. And also they don't even get paid that much. It's like, oh. And you got it. There's a guy with going into a bank with a gun, and it's like, oh, it's my job to go and stop that dude. <laughs> and I don't even get paid properly. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. The confidence evaporates in an instant when a figure barely recognizable as a man underneath layers upon layers of body armor emerges carrying an AK, turns, begins shooting, and doesn't stop for 44 minutes. Where, well, where did he get an AK? I'm assuming an AK 47 or something like that, because, I mean, uh, that's Allah some Kalashnikov or something, right? But I'm guessing AK means AK-47, like the most popular one. Um, 
What is going on? And how does he have 44 minutes of bullets? <laughs> this is the story of the North Hollywood shootout. Well, obviously, we're going to find out because that's what we're going to do over the next 20 pages. The robbers. Larry Philip Jr. was a man whose entire life was shrouded by lies and intrigue. If we look at Phillips' birth certificate, we already see quite a lot about the man. Born on Sunday the 20th of September 1970 at 10.14pm at the California Hospital on 1401 South Grand Avenue, he was the son of one Barbara Allen and Daniel Ira Warfel. His father, Daniel, was a trucker from Colorado and his mother originated from Utah. They resided at 1332 Southbound Street, Los Angeles. Yet. Already we encounter our first layer of mystery and intrigue surrounding Larry Phillips, because there's one small problem with the aforementioned details on his birth certificate. Ladies and gentlemen, their total bollocks completely fabricated. Their names, occupations, and addresses are all totally made up. There's a little note here from George. In fact, there is no 1332 Southbound Street, Los Angeles. They totally made the address up. Uh, does no one check this shit? <laughs> it's like a birth certificate. It's quite important. In reality, Barbara Allen and Daniel Ira Warfel were in fact Dorothy Clay and Larry Eugene Phillips respectively, and they were fugitives on the run from the law, and in what some may call foreshadowing, Phillips' parents were career criminals. Larry Phillips Sr. had one of the most interesting rap sheets we've ever seen on this channel. His crimes included a macabre drunken prank in which he and several of his friends dug up a coffin and stole the head of the poor deceased individual entombed within armed robbery and prison escapes. Oh, <laughs> I understand the motivation on two out of three of those. It's like your prison escapes because you don't want to be in prison. Armed robbery because you love money. and But but decapitating the, the head of a deceased person and break it, breaking into their coffin to do it. It's like, what are you up to? Why would you do this? <laughs> you just really wanted a head? When not in prison, Philip Sr. was very involved in his son's life and would take him to shooting ranges, wrestling matches, and to the gym, all while preaching to his son about his strong dislike of law enforcement. <laughs> I wonder what career this is going to lead him to. As we will see from Phillips Jr.'s later behavior, I think we can assume these were core memories for him. I feel like this can go one of two ways. If your parents are like career criminals like this and they're training you and they're talking about this, it's either like A, you're going to become a criminal, most likely option, or B, you're actually going to become a cop. I feel like those are the two paths that this could lead to. You're probably not going to become like uh, an accountant or something. Phillips Jr. soon enough followed in his father's footsteps and developed quite the sizable rap sheet of his own during his younger years. He was first arrested on September 2, 1989 after stealing $400 worth of suits from a Sears store in Alhambra. In 1992, he was arrested again after running a rental property scam in Denver, Colorado. He was clearly a man obsessed with the idea of being rich, not only because of his early crimes, but also due to his well-documented attempts at replicating Tom Vu's get-rich-quick infomercials. You don't need to be a genius to learn how to make a lot of money with my system. He's a sincere feminist. I have a feeling I know these infomercials because uh, a channel that I love on YouTube called CoffeeZilla which uh, exposes like scams and all the like shady shit that um, like these these scam people infomercial scams lately all the crypto shit gets up to it's brilliant i think he did a video on tom vu and he's like this guy who walks on the beach and talks about getting rich but it's just uh like you send me twenty dollars and i'll tell you how to get rich and then tom vu like well i don't know this is I i'm half remembering this but i'll write back and it'll be like start an infomercial campaign asking people to send you twenty dollars on how to get rich <laughs> it's like oh oh okay i see uh yeah uh, if this is the guy apparently i think he's quite famous like well known in america but that's all I know about him. Money wasn't Phillips' only passion, however. His other two passions were firearms and bodybuilding, and it's with these two that he struck up a budding friendship with one Emil, oh my god, surname. Dude, Matasarenu, his future partner in crime at Gold's Gym in Los Angeles. I feel like of all I've been to Los Angeles twice in my life. And I feel that it's one of those cities that you just know the names of places in because so many movies are set there, TV shows, all of this sort of stuff. And I don't know, I listen to like a bunch of podcasts and often the people who do the podcast, they live in this city and so they'll talk about it. And it's like, I've heard of Gold's Gym <laughs> and all of these places. Like, why? Why do I know that? I think it's because it's where Arnold Schwarzenegger used to work out. And his biography is one of my favorite books. His autobiography, Total Recall, it's a good one. 
Mata Sarano was born in Timisoara, Romania, on the 19th of July, 1966. He was an unfit boy and frequently suffered from headaches on account of his epilepsy. His parents, Varel and Valerie, who worked as a political dissident and state opera member respectively, is political dissident a job? <laughs> it's like, what do you do? I'm a political dissident. No, 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 for money. It's how people used to ask me. Before YouTuber became like an acceptable job, I feel like in the last few years that's become like, oh, I see. Now I can say like, I'm a YouTuber. I make videos on the internet. Uh, people before will be like, yeah, yeah, but what do you do for money? <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> No, I do okay. They moved to the US in 1974 in search of better and more affluent lives for themselves. I guess being a political dissident doesn't pay. An unhappy childhood full of taunting and teasing for his weight and unfamiliar accent blossomed into a happy adulthood when a passion for computing led him to completing a bachelor's degree in engineering at DeVry University of Technology. He also developed a budding interest in firearms after being introduced to them by a very heavily armored neighbor in his late teens. Quick to want to make money and improve his loss in life, Matt Asarano opens an electronics business after graduation and inspired by a lifetime of teasing, got joined Gold's Gym and got into bodybuilding. I feel a bit bad making fun of his, of his name now because he obviously got teased by us and it's... I mean, but dude, it is a name. Like, <laughs> what do they call it, you know, when you arrive somewhere and it's like they change your name? Racism. To fit in with the culture. So if you're like, uh, I don't know, like an immigrant, and they'll be like, so you've got some Italian name, and they're like, you are now John. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, this guy could have gone with Matt. That would have worked. Maybe we could just call him Matt, so I don't butcher his name throughout the rest of the video. With such overlapping interests, is it any surprise that Phillips and Matt hit it off so well? What at face value appeared to be a wholesome, mutually enriching friendship took a darker turn when the pair were thinking about their love of firearms and money and thought they could combine their interests into a new hobby. <laughs> Armed robbery. <laughs> Early robberies. The robbery of the Bank of America Branch 384 that made Matty and Phillips famous. Oh, I said it was going to be Matt. Oh, my lord. That made Matt and Phillips famous was far from their only robbery. And in fact, the bear carried out many more before the big one that made them famous. Unlike many criminals who we explore on this channel, there wasn't much of a crescendo with Matt and Phillips's crimes. They didn't start small and work their way up a cheeky sawn off hold up here, the odd post office robbery there. Oh no, no, no. Quite the opposite. They hit it hard from the start. They immediately assembled a cache of military arms and armor and put it to good use with all due enthusiasm and haste. This kind of makes sense. I mean, we I, I feel like I say it all the time on Casual Criminalist. If you're going to do a crime, do it properly. Like, look, if the punishment for armed robbery is like 20 years in jail, and it doesn't matter whether you walk into a branch with a shotgun and are like, yo, give me some money, or if you walk in with six guys and you've all got like submachine guns and you've prepared it and you're robbing a big bank and you're getting loads of money, look, if you're going to do a crime that has the same punishment, do it properly. We've talked about this. Okay. These guys are so far good criminals. I mean, bad people, good at crimes. The first robbery was a first bank owned armored car in Denver, Colorado on July the 20th, 1993. In this robbery, the guard was ambushed by Matt and Phillips carrying automatic weapons as he opened up the van, then forced a gunpoint to lie prone in the bank parking lot while they cleared out the van, netting the pair over 50 grand. Yeah, that's a little bit more than the six grand average robbery, isn't it? And this is 1997, let's just say that's about what? It's got to be at least 100 grand today. Maybe not at least 100 grand, but it's a lot of money. It's a lot more today. They were arrested on October the 23rd, 1993 on oh, No, where it went upon being pulled over for speeding. A most bountiful cash was uncovered by the investigating officer. I, George, was of two minds about including the full inventory at risk of boring you, dear listener, but just so we can appreciate the true absurdity of the incident, here it is. Oh my god, it's a, par it's a paragraph of munitions. I'll read it quickly. Um, also, if you've been robbing and you've got like money and guns in your car, how about you just go, you know, just a couple of miles per hour below the speed limit. Not suspiciously slow, but also so there's no chance of getting pulled over and them discovering a Politec semi-automatic rifle, a Norinco Mag 90 semi-automatic rifle, a Springfield Armory 45 pistol, a Colt 45 pistol, 1,649 rounds of 7.62 by 39 millimeter ammunition, three Chinese made 75 drum round magazines loaded with 7.62 by 39 ammo, 967 rounds of 9 millimeter JHP ammo, 357 rounds 
guns, a 45 JHP ammo, six smoke bombs, two improvised explosive devices, a gas mask, two sets of national armor, level 3A assault vests, two 200 channel portable programmable scanners with earpieces, sunglasses, gloves, wigs, ski masks, a stopwatch, two spray cans of gray studio hair color, three different California automobile license plates, and a sum of $1,620. Deep breath. And that was not sped up. You're welcome. I mean, it was sped up with me reading it, but it wasn't sped up in post. They were uh, arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit robbery, grand theft auto, unlawful weapons activity, and carrying a loaded firearm inside a car. These guys are going to prison for a long time. I mean, they're not, because we're super early in today's video, but how do you rob a bank, get pulled over with basically the weapons armament of a small nation, and that yet we have like 20 more pages of script to go through telling their life story? How is that even possible? Somehow, somehow, all caps from George, the charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. <laughs> and soon enough, the pair were back on the streets to commit their next robbery. How? How? Why are you... Well, I mean, I hope they at least took away all of their guns. I mean, there's probably like 50 grand's worth of guns there. The next robbery occurred on July the 14th, 1995, in Los Angeles, California, when Matt and Phillips ambushed a Brinks armored security van. In this robbery, they tried to speed up the process by opening the rear door of the truck with automatic rifle fire, killing 51-year-old security guard Herman Dwight Cook and injuring 53-year-old Felipe Cortez, the driver of the truck. They made off with over $30,000. Okay. Well, you killed someone, so now my like, until someone dies, I'm kind of excited and it's like, ooh, a robbery, and there's just people getting scared, which obviously is not great. Like, I don't want people having like post traumatic stress disorder and all that stuff. But until someone dies, it's like way less serious. Not less serious. It's way less serious. Yes, it is until someone dies, and then it's like, oh no, they killed someone, and now we just have to, you know, now they're dicks. On March the 27th, 1996, the pair attempted and failed to rob another Brinks armored van. The driver, after seeing two heavily armored men lurking in the alleyway he was due to stop in, made the pragmatic choice to skip that stop and keep on driving. <laughs> it's like, is there a guy with a big gun down there? Yeah, there is, Bob. Shall we do it? F no, Bob. <laughs> you gotta move faster, faster, mate! Go! The driver was left with minor injuries from flying glass after being fired upon by Matt and Phillips, but was otherwise unharmed, and the boys left this robbery empty-handed. Soon enough, Matt and Phillips, dissatisfied with the apparently meager takings, armored van robberies were netting them. Bros, you got like 30 grand, and you got 50 grand the- no, wait, did you? Yeah, you got 30 grand, 50 grand. How are you not satisfied with this? It's a lot of money. Just do it more often if you want more money. They wish to graduate, though, to proper bank robberies. They did this on May the 2nd, 1996, when they stormed into a branch of Bank of America at Van Nuys, Los Angeles. They stuck to their now-established modus operandi of using automatic weapons and heavy body armor. They took $755,048. God damn, that's a lot of money. A significant increase from their light uh, from their armored van robberies and don't be mistaken don't think that that's not that much money because you've seen like um i think i used to see that and i'd be like that's not that much money surely if you're robbing a bank you want millions and it's like that's just because those uh movies have really given you a at least they gave me like a real big misconception about how much money like banks actually have in there and all that stuff because you'll be like you'll be watching oceans 11 they're robbing him for like 500 mil or something and it's like in reality that's just not what most robberies are at all in any way in fact if it was 500 million that would probably be the biggest robbery of all time other than that that recent bitcoin crypto one but that's crazy and also, the amount of mu uh, the, the size and weight of that money is crazy. Like, this is one thing that really bothers me in movies when they've got like suitcases full of cash. Those are very, very heavy. Cash is very heavy. Think about it as being like a suitcase full of books, like brand new, densely packed books. And people are just like grabbing up these giant suitcases full of money. And it's like, no, that'd be extremely heavy. It's filled with paper. A month later, on May the 31st, 1996, Matt and Phillips robbed another Bank of America branch and made off with $794,200, leaving two bank tellers injured in the process. They were disappointed with this take and believed that $2 million would be waiting for them. Due to new security members a mem measures, a significant portion of that money had been collected two days earlier. Yeah, of course, this is like, wh why don't banks have that much money in them? Because they don't want to get robbed. Like now, I, I swear most banks, they just don't even have cash. They have like little signs of them saying this is a cashless branch. 
Now they all have that because no one goes into a bank to get cash. You go to an ATM. The pair always planned extensively for their heist, spending weeks scouting possible targets and covertly gathering supplies. They went above and beyond planning their next heist, determined that they were going to be no mistakes and unforeseen security measures. Sadly, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, the next shootout was going to be an abject disaster and result in one of the most destructive and high-profile shootouts in modern American history. I interrupt today's video to bring you an important message from our friends over at Bright Sellers. And they want to do something amazing. They want to send you wine direct to your door. It's like a subscription service, except instead of getting some random product, you end up getting the best product that exists in the world. Wine, which you get to enjoy in your home. And not only that, they're going to send you wines that you actually like. It's not like you go to the supermarket and you're like, oh, that seems okay. And the price is quite reasonable. Oh, that one's on sale. I'll have that. None of that. What you do with Bright Sellers, you go online, you take a little quizzy quiz, and they're like, Yo, what sort of wines do you like? Well, it's not like that. They ask you these questions, and there's no snobbery. It's not like, oh, what do you think about wines with lots of tannins? It's none of that. It's like, how do you feel about the taste of chocolate? That kind of stuff. And uh, basically, you get to the end of the quiz, and they're like, all right, we've got a good idea what we think you'll like about wine. So they send you a bunch of bottles based on that, like, quiz. And also, they have this little guarantee. They're like, we guarantee that you'll like the wine we send you, and if you don't, we'll send you an extra bottle in your next shipment because we were wrong. Because we think you'll like this next one better. Of course, it's all delivered exactly where you wanted to go, which makes everything super easy. I said that already. Brilliant. Every box is recyclable with a low footprint, which is great. I mean, it's nice to be able to drink some wine, have a good time yourself, and know that you're caring about the environment. Why not? Plus, they come with wine education cards telling you a little bit about the wine, how best to serve it, what it goes with, etc. And right now, Bright Sellers are giving you guys 50% off your first six bottle box. All you got to do is go to brightsellers.com slash casualcriminalist for a total of only $55, including shipping. Six bottles of wine for $55 is an absolute bargain. Get started today again, brightsellers.com slash casualcriminalist. And now back to today's episode. The Bank Robbery Finally, after months of planning, the big day finally came for Phillips and Matt. Their routine on the morning of the robbery is largely unknown, but I like to think that the pair woke up early on February the 28th before the break of dawn, too excited to sleep like children on the morning of Christmas Day. Yeah, I bet. Like, if you're doing a big bank robbery that day, you're probably like, you know, a little bit nervous about it. I mean, best case, you get loads of money, which is exciting. Slightly worst case, you get arrested and spend the rest of your life in prison. Worst worst case, you get shot while robbing the bank. Yeah. I mean, any of the outcomes that day, it's going to be an exciting day. Following their plan to the letter, Phillips and Matt arrived at Bank of America, 384 on Laurel Canyon Boulevard at 9.14 a.m. in a blue 1987 Chevrolet Celebrity which they had previously stolen and repainted white. They took a few minutes to themselves in the car for some last-minute preparations. We don't know exactly what they discussed, but from CCTV footage, it appears as though they reviewed their plan one last time. In and out in less than eight minutes, the known police response time. Then they both popped some phenobarbital pills, a muscle relaxant, relaxant and calming medication originally prescribed to Matt, but they both took it to keep their nerves under control. Yeah, keep the hands steady. Finally ready to go, they donned their balaclavas and strolled around to the boot of the car. Phillips popped it, and Matt quickly glanced over his shoulder to check they weren't being observed. The pair then donned their armor. Matt quickly got his comparatively light rig on and then turned to assist his friends with his significantly more substantial rig. They both grabbed a Beretta 92 pistol and a Type 56 AK. Uh, they closed the boot and then calmly strode over to the bank, wishing to save their breath and strength for the getaway. They opened the door, pushed a passerby inside with them, and began. Outside, as we already know from our introduction, officers Laurel Farrell and Martin Perello had spotted them by pure chance and issued a 1211 alert, the LAPD code for an armed robbery. The pair of officers worked in overdrive to simultaneously call in reinforcements, attempt to find a good angle to ambush the robbers as they fled, and move civilians away from the area, all while they tried to remain as silent as possible to avoid starting a panic and therefore not alert the robbers to their presence and risk a potential escalation or hostage situation. Inside, Matt and Phillips announced their presence by emptying their 75-round drum magazines all around the bank. Terror overcame the bank in an instant. Some ducked, some screamed, and some just froze in the face of the terrifying spectacle. Spent cartridges 
filled the floor, and a cascading snowstorm of flaked powder fell from the ceiling. They then offered some ever so eloquent instructions to the hostages. Everybody down! Motherfucker, get down before I kill your ass! <laughs> this is a motherfucking robbery! And they did a fucking hold up! Everyone down, motherfucker! There were, of course, numerous witnesses to this initial robbery. <laughs> yeah, no shit, George. And fortunately for us, many of them have come forward to offer their experiences to the press in the years since the robbery. Fausto Serratos, a local businessman who entered the bank mere seconds before the start of the robbery, recalled hearing the loudest and most fearsome gunfire I've ever heard. 79-year-old Mildred Knowles, who understandably was taking longer than most to get onto the floor, was slapped squarely across the face by Matt and fell to the floor, losing her glasses and headscarf from the blow. And she commented, I guess they didn't get down fast enough. <laughs> oh my god, poor lady. Matthew Shapiro was 16, was in the branch with his family during the robbery, and he commented, I heard gunshots and screaming voices, men's voices yelling, This is a hold up! I looked up, and I saw this big guy in all black, like armor. You couldn't see his face. Anita Hernandez, clutching her 23-month-old granddaughter during the robbery, immediately threw herself over her to shield her, later commenting, I knew the bullets would go right through me, but I got on top of her anyway. Matt and Phillips then made sure that everyone had dropped to the floor in the same brutish manner as Matt had applied to poor Mildred Knowles, and they then turned their attention to securing their loot. Matt stormed towards the armored door that led to the teller enclosure. This was quite a substantial obstacle, being made from one and a quarter inch thick bullet resistant polycarbonate and acrylic composite panels, but it was only designed to res resist pistol rounds up to and including a 44 Magnum. A quick burst of Matt's 7.62 mm rifle tore through the lock like scissors to paper, and quickly he was inside next on the to-do list find who had the keys to the vault this is one of those interesting things about like armored uh, i was reading about it for armored cars and it's like you kind of think i was watching it was that um it was in that new james bond movie where he's in that uh like that old aston martin and there's that scene where they're basically surrounded by people with machine guns who are emptying rounds and rounds of ammunition at that car and the windows are like this thick they're not armored in any way but somehow it's just like these bullets are just you know just just spider webbing it and there's no problem and i'll be like that's com it, this is this would last about one second before those bullets are coming through that glass and then you see like actual armored cars like the uh the beast the president of america's car and it's like the doors are thick like an airplane and the glass is like you could, it's so thick you could barely see through it because it's like it's just massive and it's like yeah that's designed to you know resist <laughs> armor piercing rounds and stuff but there's all these different levels so it's like it will only be effective up to a certain amount like if a tank shoots a shoot something at their car well that's it it's a tank <laughs> john villagrana the bank's assistant manager with deafened ears and nostrils full of smokeless powder stepped forward to answer the gunman's demands matt screamed at john get the money or we will kill you at which point villagrana made the rather pragmatic choice to acquiesce to his request and lead matt to the vault he was interrupted by the stock of matt's rifle being smashed across his face i'll do what you want he shouted desperately trying to reason with him back outside of the bank officers farrell and perio haunted by the continuing screams and automatic fire emanating from the bank had moved to the south facing car park adjacent to the bank and to get the most effective and safe arc of fire onto the soon to be fleeing robbers had moved 15 feet apart with little else he could do an increasingly agitated and distressed farrell gave a commentary to dispatch at that point a security guard who had been outside of the bank on a smoke break and who somehow had totally missed the pleas for help that emanated from his radio strolled down to the flank of the bank lungs refreshed from a liberal application of nicotine having totally missed the police officers that assembled on his right he opened the door to the bank and upon hearing the screams and gunshots turned and ran he's the bravest man i know back inside the bank matt he was inside the vault where he found five people and hurried them into the lobby motivating them with another salvo of 7.62 millimeter rounds directed to the ceiling there they were received by phillips who was working crowd control in the lobby and thrown onto the floor with the rest of the civilians everyone was subdued compliant and accounted for now matt could properly set about securing the loot outside of the bank farrell continued his transmission he informed dispatch of updates shots fired screaming etc as well as informing inbound officers of where he deemed it best for them to set up upon arrival he wanted a car opposite the entrance another car to join him on the south side of the bank and another to blockade the northwoods atm lobby of the bank 
Others now began, oh, ATM lobby, like a place where there's lots of ATMs inside, right? I was like, what's an ATM lobby? Now I understand. Officers now began arriving at the scene en masse. At 9.19 a.m., 126 seconds after Officer Farrell first made a call for aid, Detectives Tracy Angelus and William Krulak arrived and began evacuating the surrounding commercial district. A two-minute response time? I'm impressed, police. And that's getting detectives out there, not just boots on the ground. Wow. At 9.20 a.m., 171 seconds after Officer Farrell's call, Sergeant Larry Haynes arrived and, as instructed, blocked the southbound lane of traffic with his police cruiser. This is, I mean, it's super unfortunate for our bank robbers because they, what were the chances of just there being two cops just happening to pass by and see what they were up to? Because then the response time is two minutes instead of eight minutes, which is going to make a big difference, which is uh, why this video, why this podcast is probably going to end with uh well we know you know there's the, there's the shootout we the cold open had it at 9 25 a.m 25 seconds after his arrival sergeant larry haynes noticed the door of the bank swing open and who should it be but larry phillips curiously phillips was calm he appeared surprised and inquisitive rather than furious or aggressive possibly he had been made suspicious by the lack of moving traffic outside the bank or simply he was being cautious either way the game was up phillips clearly saw police cruisers albeit not all of them and he now knew him and matt were going to be putting all of their extensive planning and training to use and shooting their way out guys what are the odds of escaping this at this point the police have you surrounded this isn't a movie i don't think you're getting out of this one we will see won't we back inside the bank things started to go very wrong and the extensive range of security measures recently implemented by bank of america to combat armed robberies was starting to bite matt the bag man on his ass to say that he found this irksome would be somewhat of an understatement for start yeah dude there's a lot on the line it's like oh man these security measures are really bothering me it seems like i'm either gonna get shot by the security or police or i'm gonna go to prison forever bothersome for starters, the Bank of America had started to deliver cash in much smaller, broken-down quantities compared to what they had done in the past in order to deter snatch-and-grab thefts. These smaller boxes all had to be opened and transferred in the narrow eight-minute window they had planned for. Nonetheless, despite being deathly furious at the delay, he ordered Villa Grana, who had kept by his side, to start transferring the money into black hold all bags then came the big problem bank of america had recently started to stagger and alternate the arrival times of its bulk cash deliveries as well as running dummy or basically empty vans in order to deter armed robbery and it had worked branch 384 had yet to receive its bulk cash shipment and the vault was positively emaciated compared to what matt and phillips had been expecting to find ironically this problem was more self-induced than we might first imagine bank of america particularly in california was suffering from an epidemic of armed robberies at the time and well do you know it had been causing bank of america a lot of losses during that time that's right it was matt and phillips bank of america in particular was motivated to implement these new defensive measures specifically due to the robberies that they had recently committed yeah of course it's like they're gonna do countermeasures it's gonna happen and uh, you got to adjust to those because i mean bank robbery is still a thing i think people still rob banks you just got to adjust to the times when he saw the positively barren loot on offer in the main vault, Matt flew into a fit of blind rage. He turned to Villa Garana, his tone becoming noticeably broken and enraged, and he screams at him, Where's all of it? I want you to open up all of it now. Villa Garana tried to reason with the six foot, 283 pound monster that was standing in front of him, but Matt was having none of it. He snapped, pointed the muzzle of his Type 56 rifle into one of the cash boxes Villa Garana had yet to transfer, and emptied his magazine into it. 75 rounds of ammunition tore the contents to shred, causing a massive loss to what little loot was available, and deafened Villa Garana. On this matter, he commented, All I can see is he's not believing me, because all of a sudden he got very quiet, but now he's putting his his nozzle on me he thought i was holding out on him more money or you die i was thinking well you know this is really it for me now wow can't be it's too soon you know i didn't even say goodbye to my daughter villagrana bagged up three hundred and three thousand three hundred and five dollars and told matt that that was everything he had done as instructed and given him the lot unfortunately for matt phillips the lot included three die packs which would burst rendering most of the stolen cash worthless roughly six feet beyond branch 384's perimeter phillips was still in the lobby and becoming more and more agitated possibly caused by the activation of his flight or fight instinct and the subsequent huge dump of adrenaline he received after no after noticing the massing of police cars outside dudes things have suddenly gone really really wrong 
everything's going wrong for you today. Everything will be fine. He strided up and down the lobby, but I mean also inevitably, if you rob banks and you keep robbing banks, at some point, you know, just the more you do it, the more likely you are to get caught. He strided up and down the lobby and checked his stopwatch. He became more and more aggressive in his screams that terrified people in the lobby. He saw Matt heaving the black holdalls from the rear of the bank and barked an order to a member of staff, pointing wildly at the undamaged door on the south side of the teller kiosk, and he shouted, Open the door! Open the f***ing door now! He then turned to a security guard on the floor and delivered a heavy kick from his armored boot and continued to bark orders, Move these people to the vault now! The guard understandably froze in fear and he was unable to complete the task and instead several members of staff took it upon themselves to begin moving people to the vault. Phillips pushed the door slightly ajar and recovered with Matt. The robbery had been an abject disaster. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. They'd barely gotten $300,000 for their efforts. Their carefully planned eight-minute window of opportunity had completely collapsed, and now the building was totally surrounded. With little else that they could do, Matt and Phillips turned their attention to the forthcoming matter at hand. Escape. Good luck with this. I mean, this is either turning into a hostage situation and a shoot. Either way, there's going to be a shootout. No one's like... <laughs> There's a hostage situation where, I mean, they take the hostage, they're like, I need a helicopter, and I need the helicopter to take me to a plane, and then I need the plane to take me to Mexico. No mama's way. And it's like, that never, it's not going to work out. It, I don't know any situation where they're like, yeah, okay, rather than uh, everyone gets shot. Everyone's going to get shot, is my, is my feeling. Also, this episode is called the North Hollywood Shootout. So at some point, there's going to be a shootout, spoiler alert. The shootout. Initial response. The officers responding to the incident at Branch 384 were no strangers to armed robberies, and as they massed and surrounded the branch, they all had some pretty strong preconceived expectations about how the confrontation would go down. The gunmen would dig in inside the bank when they saw they were surrounded, and the simple robbery would escalate into a routine hostage situation and a SWAT standoff. Unfortunately for the responding officers, that preconception was very wrong. Oh. Okay, this was also totally my preconception. So, uh, let's see what's going to happen. At 9.24 a.m., after being inside Branch 384 for 7 minutes and 22 seconds, the north-facing door of the bank's ATM lobby was brutishly forced open, and from it emerged the colossal figure of a single man. Over 300 pounds of muscle and body armor, it was Phillips alone. He advanced beyond the concrete confines of the bank's entryway, pivoted to his right, and was greeted by Whitfield and Haynes, who had both set up ambush positions behind their police cruisers. What is he doing? With the smooth operation and lack of hesitancy of an automaton, Phillips pointed the iron sights of his rifle squarely at Haynes and clamped his finger down on the trigger. A volley of six rounds was unleashed at Haynes. Despite most of the incoming barrage being absorbed by the dense engine block of his police cruiser, he took one round to the left shoulder and used the last remaining strength in his now immobilized arm to pull a civilian witness, Tracy Fisher, to the floor with him as he collapsed. He was out of the fight, but also unable to be safely rescued or retreat. What on earth is that Tracy Fisher woman doing there? I understand she's a witness, but can't we be like, all right, Tracy, you can go home now, please, and we'll contact you later, rather than, how about you hang out around by my police car with me and my gun and become a target for people escaping the bank? <laughs> what is that about? The game had changed. These were not rounds being fired to scare or intimidate. These rounds were being fired to kill. Phillips kept his rifle shouldered and began to survey the situation. Noticing movement by the second police cruiser, he emptied the remaining 69 rounds of his Romanian drum magazine into the vehicle. So ferocious was this barrage that glass fragments and metal spalling from the cruiser acted as unintended canister shot and sent shrapnel straight towards Martin Whitfield, who had been taking cover behind it. He's wounded in the left arm, right femur, and twice in the chest. Whitfield kept his composure throughout this traumatic ordeal, later commenting, You've been shot, I thought. Don't panic. Then I was shot again. And again. Confusion raged around the responding officers. The unending concrete of North Hollywood echoed the thunderous booms of Phillips's rifle in all directions and made pinpointing his exact location difficult. Officers raced in all directions, desperate to fight and desist. I'm beginning to see why this probably wasn't the worst idea ever, because you're in a bank. Let's say you're in a bank, you're one of these robbers, and the police are outside. The only thing that's going to happen is more police with bigger guns are going to arrive. So making your go at it now 
kind of makes more sense rather than give because your situation's not going to change you're stuck inside a bank you can't call for reinforcements nothing's going to happen so you kind of might as well fucking go for it while the police without the big guns are outside 60 feet to the west in the northeast corner of the bank's parking lot sat another police cruiser manned by rookie cops dean schram and william lance who had six weeks and five days on the force respectively why is one guy what what why are two rookie cops in the car together don't they pair the rookie cop with the veteran cop so it's like you're just driving around how long have you been doing this cop thing six weeks how long have you been doing this cop thing five days <laughs> That's just asking for trouble. Don't believe me, just watch. The pair were ordered to relocate and tried to make a beeline for the Del Taco car park to their rear. They were interrupted by far from Phillips, at which point Shram dropped back behind the immediate and relative safety of their police cruiser, and Lance, with his back to Phillips and unaware of the immediate danger he faced, continued running for the car park. Lance took around to the rear of his left knee and fell to the ground. Heroically, he still clutched his Ithaca 37 shotgun tightly, put himself behind the most solid cover he could drag himself to, and began returning fire on Phillips. The uninjured Shram did the same from behind the police cruiser. This is pretty, this got super intense super quickly. These guys are into some like Grand Theft Auto sh to all intents and purposes, Phillips had neutralized his immediate threats, but unbeknownst to him, an officer needs assistance call Hayes had made eight minutes prior had yielded dividends, and the full force of the LAPD was racing northwards to aid their wounded colleagues. The arriving officers dug in and secured a wider perimeter around the north, south, and east exits from the bank. At the same time, Officer Zborovan took the initiative and attempted to flank Phillips. The rookie officer, who had only been on the force for six weeks in the same graduating class, as Officer Dean Schramm was not letting his relative inexperience be any kind of barrier to a bold and daring act of heroics. I kind of imagine in a way that the new guys are a bit more heroic because they've not seen as much shit and they've not seen as many of their friends die. So they're like, yeah, I'm going to go in there, you know, let's go. And it's like, and the veteran cop will be like, all right, mate, chill out. Let's just see how this pans out, yeah? Yeah, I got a family. You don't yet, but maybe you want one. Let's not get ourselves killed. Six weeks into the job, okay? okay and that's why it's good to pair the veterans with the rookies am i insane isn't that how it's done has every movie i've seen been wrong where they have the veteran and then there's the rookie and they team up and then they go on like an adventure together in it's buddy cop movies that's what it is he circled the row of stores to Phillips's flank, racked his Ithaca Model 37 shotgun, and stepped out to engage Phillips, who now had his back to him. He pointed his iron sight squarely on Phillips's back, pulled the trigger, racked it, and fired a second time. Phillips stood 211 feet away from Zboravan, so it was incredibly unlikely that the rookie officer would land the shot, yet 211 feet with a shotgun? is a distance but much to zvoravan's dismay he saw philip stagger forward and indeed eight pellets had landed on philip's back one of which even found a path through a small gap between his torso and leg armor and subsequently planted itself firmly in philip's ass unfortunately for zvoravan this was little more than an inconvenience for philip's whose attention was now firmly on zvoravan the row of shops that he had circled and the officers fortified within them. He grabbed a fresh drum magazine, reloaded his rifle, and poured fire into the surrounding area. In a further display of heroism's Borovan, it threw himself on top of unarmored Detective Angela's, and rounds destined for the detective struck his body mere seconds after landing. This Borovan guy, he might be new, and he might be a bit bold, but that is some heroic shit right there. Good for you. I hope you got some sort of medal or award. With that situation pacified, Phillips turned his attention back northwards, where Hayes, Whitfield, and three civilians were still trapped. As much as they prayed otherwise, they were about to be brutally shown that Phillips had not forgotten about them. Phillips continued to sink countless rounds into Hayes' police cruiser in the area surrounding it. Hayes saved Tracy Fisher's life again when she lost her cool, stood up, and attempted to flee the scene despite the incoming fire. Hayes grabbed her ankle and pulled her back down behind cover. This was mere moments before the car, but she was standing behind, was shredded with rounds. The officers and detectives by the row of stores took this opportunity to remove themselves from the scene. Zboravan had been hit three times while shielding Detective Angeles. He was losing a worrying amount of blood, and he needed immediate medical attention. Zboravan and Krulak attempted to sneak across the car park, taking their time to move slow and hoping that Phillips wouldn't spot them. This didn't work, and upon seeing the retreating officers, Phillips began dumping magazine after magazine at them. At the same time, Officer Guy and Detective Angelus were trying to make a break across the north of the car park. Guy made it behind the relative safe cover of a Dodge Caravan, but Angelus didn't share the same luck. She tripped, losing her pistol and radio in the process, and was subsequently left completely exposed in the open. 
Fortunately for Angelus, Philip then pivoted towards Krulak and Zborovan, who were making a break for a nearby dentist's office and started opening fire on them. Whether this was an act of mercy on his part or the simple pragmatism of Angelus no longer presenting an immediate threat, uh, we don't know. This guy doesn't seem like a very merciful dude. He's shooting at civilians and cops and all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm going to say it's pragmatism there. She doesn't have a gun anymore, so he's like, she's not a threat. Let's shoot some people who are a threat. Krulak and Zborovan crashed through the glass door of the dentist's office, which had been shot out by Phillips mere seconds before their approach. The owner of the practice, one Dr. Jorge Montes, who was hiding out in the rear of the building with his staff and patients, came to investigate upon hearing the sound of smashing glass and screaming in his lobby, and immediately began providing medical assistance to the badly wounded officers Borovan and Detective Krulat, the latter of whom had taken a shrapnel wound to his right ankle as he fled across the car park. Both needed immediate hospital treatment, but for obvious reasons. That uh, was not going to be forthcoming. You may be wondering now, ladies and gentlemen, where are all those reinforcements that were racing to the scene previously? They had set up another cordon beyond that set up by the initial responding officers, as already mentioned, and a number of problems were stopping them rushing in and subduing the gunmen. Firstly, they knew full well that they were outgunned, having nothing more than 9mm self-loading pistols to face against the automatic rifle fire. Yeah, but where's SWAT? La, la, la. Come on, SWAT, let's go! You guys have got the big guns, you scary. Let's go. Secondly, in this initial stage of the shootout, command and control had completely collapsed, with early coordination being carried out between responding officers on the ground and police control over radios, and as the aforementioned officers were incapacitated or otherwise occupied, coordination eventually collapsed. Fortunately, Lieutenant Nicholas Zingo, the North Hollywood Watch commander at this point, arrived on the scene to take command, and he began to coordinate some kind of effective resistance against the gunmen. With the initial responders subdued and Phillips' magazines nearly empty, a lull in the fighting ensued, and at 9.28 a.m., a mere four minutes after the shooting started, Phillips retreated back to Branch 384 to reconvene with Matt and plan their next move. Well, this sounds all like a terrible idea. Like, I was at first, you've got to make a break for it now. But now he's going back inside after just using a bunch of ammunition and just getting everybody angry. That's This is just much worse for you now. You had to make a run for it. The Shootout Flight from Branch 384 Philip and Matt's movements back within the bank are largely unknown, with all the staff having been evacuated the bank vault before the shooting began. At 9.30 a.m., they were spotted entering the North Face ATM lobby by the machine's inbuilt security cameras, bags of loot in tow. They hunkered down, and from the relative safety of the ATM lobby's concrete walls, they began to lay down fire on newly approaching officers and the initial responders, displaying exceptional skills and drills for a lowly pair of bank robbers. Matt and Phillips exchanged firing positions multiple times and covered each other's reloads as they threw hundreds of rounds out of the lobby. But where is all of this going? As I mentioned earlier, I mean, the longer you stay there, the less ammo you have and the more reinforcements the police get. You've got to come up with a plan. You can't just keep doing this. You will eventually lose. It makes no sense. In response to the renewed barrage of gunfire, the wounded officers Borovan began doing what he could to gather all of the wounded officers to the relative safety of Jorge Montes' dental clinic. Desperately, he urged Stuart Guy and Tracy Angelus over his radio to run for it, and they did exactly that. The gunmen, still held up in the ATM lobby, immediately responded with gunfire as they attempted to move. Tracy Angelus made it as rounds perforated the air around her. She crashed into the dental clinic on the same spot where Borovan and Krulads had landed minutes earlier. Stuart Guy was less lucky. Zboravan from upstairs and Angela's from the floor of the lobby turned and saw a splattering of fine red mist erupt from their comrade's knee, and he fell out of view beneath the surrounding cars. The wound lifted Guy from his feet as his leg collapsed from underneath him. Firmly immobilized, but very much alive, he did what he could to stabilize his condition. He dragged himself a few feet and rested his back against the wheel of a white Dodge caravan, and then used his gun belt as a jerry-rigged tourniquet to stop his knees heavy bleeding. At this point, the pair were low on ammunition and needed to resupply, having gotten a bit too trigger-happy during the initial robbery and subsequent confrontation with police. Matt remained in the ATM lobby and laid down covering fire for his criminal comrade as Phillips moved northward back towards their Chevy celebrity. This move would be a major error. The pair were split up uncoordinated and had surrendered the reasonably defensible position of the ATM lobby in its four-sided concrete walls. Now, instead of having their occupants channeled towards them in controllable arcs of fire, Philip and later Matt would get attacked from multiple angles. Yeah, but they can't stay in that ATM lobby forever, George. Like, if they're, it's like, yeah, okay, they've got a great position and they're holed up and it's super secure, but eventually they're going to run out of ammunition and that's it. 
so they have to change something they have to try something else Phillips made it to the car unscathed because he stopped to take a few pot shots along the way. At the car, he grabbed a fresh complement of drum magazines for his Type 56. Matt then went to do the same, but he was not as lucky as Phillips. Just as he reached the getaway car, he was interrupted by two bullets. One pistol round fired by one Officer Tomlin, scoring a glancing blow just above the right eye, opening up a six-inch wound across his face. Oh my god. That is a bad injury. But leaving him otherwise unharmed and fighting fit. <laughs> A six-inch gash in your face from a bullet? That is intense. Matt may have been physically fine, but mentally, this struck him deep. He fell to one knee on the bonnet of the car, and in disbelief or pain, kept feeling around the wound. He was shocked one inch deeper, and did a bit of dead man. At this point, Matt was proverbially licking his wounds. The second round hit him, scoring a shot above his right calf. He abandoned his bag of loot, got in the car, and fired it up. A desperate call was heard over the police radio, repeatedly screaming, Do not stop the getaway vehicle. They've got automatic weapons. There's nothing we have that can stop them. This was seemingly unknown to Phillips, who was still in the north car park, happily unloading volleys of fire, two approaching officers and media helicopters, five of which were now circling overhead and would continue to do so for the remainder of the shootout. George left a note here. The full footage is readily available on YouTube, and it's well worth a watch for anyone interested. After you finish this video, of course, that sweet, delicious watch time means I can pay my bills. You damn skippy, George. Um, yeah, if you're in a media helicopter and they're firing at you, aren't you like, well, let, let's let the other guys cover this one. <laughs> Is the helicopter pilot? I'll be like, nope, let's get out of here. And they'll be like, stay, stay, I'm getting some great shots. And I'll be like, yo, you don't pay me enough for this shit. <laughs> I'm a helicopter pilot. There's going to be another job that I can do. I got skills. The drive through banking lane in particular seemed to be of particular interest to Phillips, who must have reasoned it was an ideal place for a police ambush. Two identified officers came to approach this way across the rear of the lot and were warned off by a volley of a dozen rounds. Two officers, Bancroft and Harley, who had been watching from a distance to the south, took this as an opportunity to strike and began unloading at Phillips. Officer Brenlinger, who was stationed between two of the groups of officers, also joined in, shooting 27 rounds at Phillips, all of which hit, but none of which penetrated his body armor. Oh my god. Imagine shooting a guy 27 times, like, over and over again. You're, like, reloading, and he's just fine. He's just like, like in some sort of movie. That's intense. This became the police's tactic for several minutes. One group of officers unloaded their pistols at Phillips, praying one round found a chink in his armor, and while Phillips was distractedly returning fire, the other group would open up and repeat. Yeah, this is, I mean, how is this going to end? Of course he's going to die. There's, I, there's no possible way that these guys are making it out of this alive. Right? At the same time, a crash anti-gang unit was having the big brain idea of trying to procure some heavier firepower that might actually be able to put Phillips down. Yeah, where is SWAT? Where is SWAT? They headed to the B&B &B gun store on Oxnard Street, less than a mile from Branch 384. Five Colt Sporters, two Remington Model 1180-cent shotguns, and a liberal amount of filled magazines were happily handed over by a civil-minded owner who was more than willing to be of assistance. That'd be so intense. The police just come in, We need your guns! Be like, oh my god, okay. Shall I start you a tab? And give us the bloody guns! Thankfully, at this point in the shootout, the wounded officers from the initial confrontation also began to be rescued. Orders were not attempted to extract wounded officers while the shooting was still in progress, owing to the risk of creating further casualties. Officers Anthony Cabonuts and Todd Schmitz jointly said, well, f*** that, and bravely began sweeping the scene while keeping their heads down and extracting who they could. They came across Guy and Whitfield and managed to extract both of them before the arrival of an armored car many minutes later. Matt, by this point, had reconnected with Phillips, the former of was sat in the driver's seat of the car, ready to make a break for it, while the latter stayed outside and provided covering fire in the direction of anyone brave enough to approach the pair. Eventually, he moved to the boot of the car and swapped his Type 56 for an HK91. Why exactly, we aren't sure, as the car was eventually recovered with plenty of 7.62mm AK rounds still in the boot. Probably, I don't know, like, logical decision making at this point. I'm like, under the pressure of all of this stuff, you just be like, go, 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 go. You don't think about it too much. The pair's actions during this somewhat of a lull can only be described as time-wasting. They went nowhere and seemingly did not but continued to harass oncoming officers with barrages of rifle fire. All the while, the car was getting more and more shredded, less and less serviceable, and bullets kept bouncing off Matt and Phillips. How long before one of those bullets hit something important in the car, or how long until some of those bullets managed to find the weak points in the pair's armor? Phillips even opened fire on the pursuing media helicopters at this point and sent 30 rounds up to the KKL 9 news chopper 
we just ask why. Meanwhile, because he's crazy, these guys are crazy. They're absolutely insane. Like, they're in some sort of, like, shooting rage. It's mental. This is, like, a scene in a movie. And you'd be like, this is um, this just is a little bit over the top, isn't it? I don't really believe this. Like, SWAT would be there by now. These guys would have made a getaway. Something like that. You just, they, they wouldn't have so much ammunition. It's like, this is movie level sh- right here. Meanwhile, the police were only solidifying their position. More and more officers arrived on the scene, and what's more, SWAT had finally made their way through the immobile Los Angeles traffic and arrived on the scene, having so little time to prepare that some still wore the outfits from their morning run, which had been interrupted by the shootout. What is going on? Isn't this like a super like special weapons and tactics? Aren't you supposed to be like ready to go, locked and loaded? Like, what? Why the delay? I have a life. I have a. I have a family. The SWAT team also requisitioned a passing armored transport car, not the best protection against the robbers' heavy weaponry, but it was better than nothing, and allowed them to extract wounded officers and then try to get close to the assailants. Why doesn't SWAT have their own armored transport car? Why are they like, <laughs> I feel like the SWAT were just, they were on a run, they were all just chilling out, and then someone's like, there's a robbery downtown, they're like, oh, f- okay, put your t-shirts on, guys, grab your guns, and let's go steal us a car. It's like, why aren't they like firemen sitting around, having a cup of tea, and then a thing comes in, they all slide down a pole, they get in a big armored truck, and they're like, <laughs> and they go and deal with this shit. SWAT is not like it is portrayed in the movies. Suddenly, there was a desperate shout on the police scanner. Suspect vehicle is moving. Repeat, suspect vehicle is moving. Matt had decided that they were getting out of there. He swung the <laughs> about bloody time. He swung the car around to Phillips and scooted over to the passenger seat. All Phillips had to do was hop in and they could make their escape. And with the car already being down two tires, there wasn't a moment to waste. But for some reason, Phillips didn't hop in. Instead, he maneuvered around to the rear of the vehicle, taking single aimed shots at as many officers in range as he went. All unwounded officers present, at least six that can be accounted for, returned the favor and unloaded their magazines at Phillips. And in that 9mm volley, at least three rounds struck Phillips. One round struck Phillips on his left hand, blowing a large chunk of flesh out from the palm of his thumb as it exited, and the second two striking his rifle, one impacting the dust cover in the bolt and the other into the magazine well. The HK-91, totally inoperable, new magazines couldn't be inserted and the action wouldn't properly cycle. He fired off a couple more rounds before the action totally locked up and then he discarded the rifle on the floor. But not to panic, he no doubt thought he would simply retrieve another Type 56 from the boot. Well, there was no panic, except for the extra wounds that he picked up in the process when an officer landed a one in a thousand shot and placed a nine millimeter round up the sleeve of his body armor and this tore up his fore arm oh dude but luckily for phillips it avoided any major muscles or nerves when it tumbled damn dude this is like you're getting pretty f- up if you escape from this you're gonna need hospital so fast but how on earth are you gonna escape in a car that's got two flat tires this is your just give up my guys come on never now they could finally make their escape yeah good luck with that guys and to do so, Matt took command of the car while Phillips hovered around on foot providing covering fire. This went quite well initially, with civilians and officers alike keeping their head down as Phillips began to unload in the direction of anything that moved. I say it went well initially because there was one problem. The new Type 56 was a complete heap of junk. Upon examining the rifle today, it appears as though it was converted for automatic firing by an enthusiastic apprentice on his first day of the proverbial workshop. It malfunctioned after three short bursts, and Phillips stopped to clear the malfunction, but all while Matt inched the car forwards, frantically trying to encourage his criminal comrade into the car and desperately pleaded for the pair to make an escape. For some reason, and this one really boggles my mind, so let me know what you think, dear viewers. After advancing with Matt for several yards, Philip simply abandoned him and made a break for it on foot. I thought you were my friend! I- Dude, you are so f- up. You've got all of these injuries. You must be... You, didn't he, they say he had like 300 pounds? He was 300 pounds with all the armor and guns and stuff? What are you thinking? Matt, no doubt, had some choice words for the sudden turn of character and for the sake of Simon's monetization. We'll let you in the audience fill in the blanks for yourselves. <laughs> Whatever blue words were uttered, Matt did the only thing he could at this point. He put his foot down and made a break for it himself.
With the situation obviously deteriorating, Philip stormed eastward towards Archduke Street and tried to maintain his situational awareness by sidestepping as he turned his head back and forth. Philip's luck would change in an instant as in the next few seconds he would receive two wounds that would spell the beginning of the end for him. The first was a 5.56mm round fired by an unknown SWAT officer in the distance. Unluckily for Phillips, this round glanced off his torso armor and continued upwards, found a soft spot in his armor, and entered his shoulder. Luckily for Phillips, the high velocity of this round carried it straight through him, and since it avoided any major blood vessels or nerves, he was able to carry on largely unimpeded from this wound, save for the blood loss. Ironically, had a worse pistol round with a blur velocity entered him at this point and tumbled rather than cleanly exiting, it would have left him in much worse condition. Yeah, the pistol rounds, um that the police use. I, I don't know if I'm right in this, because I'm really not an expert, and I know there are definitely people who are experts on guns who are going to comment below, so excuse my ignorance. But if I'm getting it right, I don't know, not 100% sure, is that the regular cops who carry the, like, uh, 9mm guns, the sidearms, they use hollow points, right? So the idea is, if they shoot someone, that bullet is going to enter them, and then pfft, kind of, like, stay inside them, which is terrible. And it's like, I believe they're not, you can't get them normally they're only for police or something because the idea is that if you shoot someone it doesn't pass through and then kill someone else like a, a civilian who's not involved in any in any crimes it just stays in the person you're intending to shoot but the you know the uh the downside of that is it does them a brutal amount of damage because the rounds like uh, fragments again not 100 percent sure about that Phillips shook himself off from this round and continued seemingly unimpeded. He became fixated on an officer on the east side of Archwood, and as he stepped out from behind a trailer, he received the second wound, again from an unidentified SWAT officer in almost the exact same place as the first. Unfortunately for Phillips, he wouldn't be able to shake this one off. Rather than a clean in and out, this round entered almost an inch lower and shattered his right collarbone, severed his subclavian artery, and fractured his right shoulder blade as it went downwards into his back tissue. Oh my god. If this guy, I mean, he's, I don't think he's going to survive this this whole affair. Oh, wait, it's, it's his demise. Demise might not mean death, though. It could just be his capture. He is going to need so much surgery and rehab. As if fate wasn't unkind enough to Phillips in that moment, this was the moment his junk type 56 decided to jam. Oh my god, I thought he was going to take a, take a round in his junk for a second, which is something I don't like thinking about, but I'm now thinking about... Brilliant. He lets off a three rounds burst approaching SWAT officers and went to immediately repeat the favor, but the second round failed to eject properly, jammed up in the left side of the receiver, and temporarily rendered the rifle inoperable. This should have been an easy enough malfunction to clear, but for some reason, possibly the very large hole in his left shoulder, Phillips was panicking and not thinking straight. He took a knee at the rear of the aforementioned trailer and, and charged the rifle three times, only worsening the problem. The first pull of the bolts pulled a fresh round from the magazine, and the forward motion of the bolt shoved it underneath the initial jammed round, and the final two simply smashed the jam rounds together even tighter. His rifle was inoperable, and Phillips was well and truly up the proverbial creek without a paddle. There's a note here from George. This is actually a very easy jam to clear on an AK. Top cover off, bolt assembly out, shake the rounds out, and return the bolt assembly and top cover. It's easy enough from the comfort of my air-conditioned office anyway. If I was in the middle of a firefight and had been shot many, many times, odds are I'd be a bit sloppy too. Oh, okay. George. <laughs> George, everyone already thinks you're a spy because you mentioned in an episode previously how you had been sh you were shooting and had been shot at. And everyone already thinks you're a spy. <laughs> John Caprarelli, a 15-year veteran of the LAPD, who was moving to intercept Phillips, happened to catch a glimpse of him when instinctively turning his head to safely check for oncoming traffic, and decided enough was enough. He angled himself to have a clear view of Phillips's back, raised his Beretta 92, and let off six rounds in under two seconds. He retreated, rendezvoused with several officers, who all then proceeded to empty their magazines at Phillips also. Phillips then stood up, and with his primary weapon inoperable, he drew his own Beretta 92 and began slowly advancing on the officers, shooting as he walked. His stride seemed to have lost the self-confident swagger that it had when he first emerged from Branch 384, had he resigned himself to the inevitable. Yes, I mean, surely at this point you'd be like, what am I going to do? I'm facing off against a SWAT team with a Beretta. Like, what? what is the possible outcome here other than your death? Rounds continued to bounce off of Phillips' armor as he exchanged shots with the intercepting officers. A round glanced across his right hand, tearing his glove and leaving a slight graze on his hand, making him drop his pistol. Despite being one of the most minor wounds he received, this appeared to be the straw that finally broke the camel's back 
and made him give up. He looked down at the pistol, his entire body slumped as if letting out a sigh. He retrieved the pistol from the ground and finally decided that he was done. He turned away from the pursuing police officers, placed the muzzle of the pistol under his chin, and after pausing for a couple of seconds, he pulled the trigger. The 9mm jacketed hollow point round penetrated straight through his skull, and Phillips was dead before his nervous system could even register the pain. A pink mist momentarily erupted through his ski mask. Larry Eugene Phillips Jr. fell to the ground, dead. And I'd have sympathy for him if he hadn't already like killed a bunch of people, or a bunch of people, or injured. He'd killed someone at least. I mean, this guy seems like a horrible piece of shit. So uh, yeah, too bad. <laughs> Matt's demise. At the moment of Phillips's suicide, 38 minutes into the shootout. Oh my God, this so much has gone on in 38 minutes. This is so crazy. Matt was alive and kicking, completely unaware of his partner's demise. Unbeknownst to him, he had only another six minutes left to live. And during foreshadowing, <laughs> spoiler alert, and during this time, his disjointed and directionless attempts to flee transformed into the actions of a wild and rabid dog backed into a corner. Matt was still in command of the Chevrolet Celebrity Getaway car, although with three fat t flat tires, all its windows shattered, and a bodywork riddled with bullet holes, it was certainly worse for wear. He rolled through the intersection of Agnes and Gentry without slowing, forcing the oncoming traffic to slam to a halt. He was after one thing and one thing alone in that instant, a new serviceable getaway vehicle this is like i mean it's literally like an episode of gta where i mean it's not literally like that because obviously this is real life and people good people are dying because you're a piece of shit. but this is like how i would rob a bank in gta and it's like oh no they've got my cars on fire quick 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 get a new car get it not this piece of shit. okay let's go but in real life it's obviously horrid Ahead of him, a red Ford Tempo was trundling along, seemingly unaware of the abject chaos around it. And Matt violently pulled his Chevrolet celebrity around in front of it with a handbrake turn, forcing the red saloon to stop. Between the hordes of police cars in pursuit, the helicopters circling overhead, and the bullet-ridden Chevrolet being driven by a masked man, the driver of the Ford Tempo eventually realized something was amiss and made the undeniably sensible decision to throw the car in reverse and f*** off. Matt, now out of his own car, waved at the owner to come back, and when this somewhat optimistic gesture failed, he let a single round off at the tempo in anger, fortunately hurting no one in the process. He turned to face east and saw the heavily armored remains of Phillips lying motionless in the dirt and was left in no doubt about his odds of survival. He got back in the car and did nothing for several moments, seemingly in shock, before he threw the car in drive and continued his escape. He attempted to bring several more civilian cars to a stop but failed before he then laid waiting in ambush at an intersection in the hope of improving his odds. He soon found his new ride after successfully pulling over an aerospace engineer named Bill Ma, who was, really? Who was on his way back to work and, ironically, had been diverted down his current path by the police blockade. Getting frustrated by the time he was taking to get out of the car, Matt shot at Bill Ma, wounding the poor man, who then fled the scene on foot. He retrieved an XM15 from the boot of the now immobile Chevrolet and tried to make his escape in Bill's Jeep Cherokee. Two problems with that. Number one, the truck was fitted with a kill switch, which Bill immediately flipped when he realized he was being carjacked. Number two, the truck was a manual, and Matt didn't know how to drive a manual. Oh, what a loser! Whoops a daisy. <laughs> also, Bill, he's got a kill switch, huh? Like, I do. Okay, people have these? During the commotion of this failed carjacking, a SWAT team had finally managed to close the gap with Matt and was bearing down on his position. At last, come on, SWAT, let's go! They immediately opened up on Matt upon disembarking, pinning Matt down with suppressive fire and leaving him nowhere to run. Eventually, one officer Anderson, who had been closing the gap with Matt, had a clear line of sight, double tapped two rounds into the gunman's center mass. Matt staggered and slammed into the bonnet of his car before sliding down it and collapsing. So had Anderson finally downed Matt? He had not. Owing to a thick steel trauma plate Matt had jury-rigged onto his ballistic vest, this normally fatal shot, which would have made short work of the armor, was no more damaging than a very, very hard punch to the chest. Matt returned fire, some shots calculated and targeted, others being wild, uncontrolled volleys that further tore his own car apart as they missed woefully. At this point, the SWAT team, upon noticing Matt was all but unarmored on his legs, made the shrewd decision to target his lower body. 
and there's a note here it's a long note it may sound stupid to us viewers that it took the police this long to realize this but if i may offer some insight in combat you are a creature of impulse and muscle memory as a combatant you are drilled and drilled and drilled on procedure to the point that your body's muscle memory naturally goes to execute it even if completely overcome with stress and anxiety likely the responding officers up to this point were simply aiming for the center mass as drilled into them during training this was in very stressful circumstances and it's only when the initial burst of adrenaline and flight or fight instincts subside it, that they were actually able to notice to us as onlookers is blindly obvious yeah okay that makes perfect sense because i was reading about uh how they changed things after i think it was the second world war with the military how people were really good at shooting targets but when they got into war they were terrible at shooting people because they didn't want to shoot people and they started basically training the military to have this like muscle memory you don't think you just pull the trigger so they started shooting at targets shaped like people and all of this stuff and they worked on the psychology of it and then it went from like 10% to like 90% uh, people willing to shoot other people, which was crazy. And it's sort of like this uh, muscle memory. You just go in and you do what you've been drilled to do thing. Matt was hit again and again and again in the legs. And even after receiving over 20 rounds to the legs seemed undeterred. For uh, note five, adrenaline is a hell of a drug, yo. <laughs> Holy sh getting shot 20 times in the legs and being like, I'm good. <laughs> it is just a flesh wound. Eventually, he received a direct shot to his knee and collapsed down onto one leg, but rather than surrendering, hobbled over to the bonnet of the Chevrolet and used it as a platform to continue firing at the intercepting officers. At this point, this is just suicide by cop. This is just it. I mean, what's the point? Ma received four further wounds from that kneeled position. The first was a shot that passed straight through his thigh, which, as we've already learned, isn't necessarily as bad as it first appears. Two further shots hit almost the same spot, but tumbled inside him and caused extensive tissue and muscle damage. He kept firing somehow. A round hit his left ankle, and he spun down onto the ground and crumbled into a pile. As he writhed in pain, he clamped his finger down on the trigger and let three rounds off as he fell. Finally, all but out of the fight, wounded and low on ammunition, Matt, from his increased untenable position on the floor let out one final blind fired volley onto the officers from underneath the car officer gomez seeing his opportunity to bring the fight to a close lined up his shot and emptied his magazine towards matt three rounds landed in matt's forearm all but tearing it to shreds now separated from his weapon and most of the arm holding it the swat officers piled on and he held up what was left of his arms in surrender the last shot was fired at 10:04 a.m 44 minutes after the first one was unleashed Matt was placed under arrest, but he seemed to find this somewhat objectionable, repeatedly making rather explicit requests for police to shoot him in the head. Oh my god. I can't believe he actually survives. This is mental. He's gonna need so much surgery. Matt would get his wish for death granted. Oh, okay. But it wouldn't be delivered from an officer's AR-15. Instead, Matt and Phillips had caused so much chaos that the area wasn't deemed safe for ambulances to enter until 70 minutes after the former's surrender, and he bled to death, kicking and screaming on the floor before any medical assistance could arrive. America's biggest and most devastating shootout was finally over. Well, this was super intense. The arms and armor. I don't know about yourselves, but I, George, personally found the insane variety of weaponry the criminals of today's show assembled to be one of the most fascinating elements of the case, so I hope I won't bore you too much if we now take some time to examine the hardware that Phillips and Matt held in their cache. Even for those not super interested or clued up on firearms, it should nonetheless prove an interesting tangent and allow you to be able to appreciate the sheer absurdity of the firepower that the pair brought to the table during the shootout. Yeah, and also the armor and stuff? It must have been crazy. These guys got shot like hundreds of times. Or maybe not hundreds, but dozens of times. It's mental. A total of three Chinese 56 AK rifles were used throughout the robbery, with two being used by Phillips and one by Matt. To all intents and purposes, and to avoid getting bogged down in pedantries, the Type 56 AK is an amalgamation of both the Soviet AK-47 and AKM rifle, both of which were supplied to the People's Republic of China by the Soviet Union in the mid-1950s. Nominally, the rifle is select fire, able to fire in both single, self-loading, and automatic, but the types used today were civilian-grade self-loaders, illegally converted it for automatic firing. Mats and Phillips both used 30 round box magazine and 75 drum magazines in their Type 56s. The Type 56 is a reasonably heavy rifle weighing 3.9 kilograms unloaded, 4.8 kilograms loaded with a 30 round magazine, and 5.9 kilos loaded with a drum magazine. It fires the 7.62 by 39 millimeter Soviet round 
quite a heavy one. The accuracy of the AK rifles is hotly debated, but from personal experience, they're perfectly accurate out to about 300 yards when fired in a single shot, but if you clamp your finger down on the trigger, good luck getting a good grouping on a barn door at 25 yards. The first round goes where you want, the rest go where they want. What are you saying, George? George. <laughs> George, George. <laughs> this random Chinese rifle that you just happen to have used. <laughs> That's also made use of a Bushmaster XM15 E2S during the shootout. The XM15 is a generally good quality, self-loading, semi-automatic AR-15 style rifle manufactured by Bushmaster Firearms International, firing the 5.56 45mm NATO rounds. Once again, this rifle was a civilian self-loader converted for automatic firing. It's a bit concerning that you could just convert a gun to automatic firing. That doesn't sound good at all. It sounds I know it's illegal, but it shouldn't be possible. I mean, anything's possible, of course, because you just the person in a workshop can do all sorts of stuff. They could probably make an automatic gun, but eh, maybe not. That's probably quite tricky. This should not be allowed. I mean, not not allowed, not possible. Matt used both 30-round box magazines and 100-round Beta-C magazines in his XM15. It weighed 3.75 kilograms unloaded, 4.2 kilograms loaded with 30 box magazines, and 4.85 kilograms loaded with a Beta-C magazine, making it a bit lighter and generally a bit handier than the AKs also used. Personally, I, George, find AR rifles to be perfectly acceptable firearms, reasonably accurate, reasonably reliable, and generally up to the task of keeping one alive when warranted, but I do find them a bit dull. They are the Toyota Corollas of the rifle world. As already alluded to, all of the automatic rifles used during the shootout, namely the Type 56 AKs and the Bushmaster XM15s, were legal, albeit not for convicted felons in the state of California at the time, but had been illegally converted to automatic fire in the case of the Type 56s and select fire in the case of the XM15. And there is another lengthy note here which we will read. Converting a self-loading... Ah, oh, okay, we're going to get a bit more into this. Self-loading rifle into an automatic one is actually a surprisingly straightforward process and generally within the means of anyone with access to even a basic home workshop. I'm just going to read this to make sure we don't tell people how to do it. Nope, we're not going to read that. I mean, it doesn't tell people how to make an automatic gun, but it does walk you through the theory of it, which I, uh, I don't think is a good idea. Phillips also made use of a, obviously, but people can Google it, Simon. I know that, but why spread information that is just not necessary when not necessary? Phillips also made use of a German manufactured Heckler & Koch M91A3, the self-loading single-shot civilian variant of the G3, the German military's former service rifle. Phillips' modified rifle weighed 5.05 kg unloaded and 5.6 kg when loaded with exclusively 30-round box magazines. It was chambered in 7.62 by 51 mm NATO, a full-size round rather than the intermediate cartridges used in the Type 56 and XM15, making it by far the most deadly and dangerous rifle used by the pair in the shootout. They also carried Beretta 92FS sidearms. This is basically your standard modern 9x19mm Parabellum self-loading military pistol. Pretty standard, and there's nothing overly exciting to report here. Both men complemented their fearsome munitions with equally substantial armor. Here we go. Phillips wore a self-produced suit of aromatic polyamide body armor that, as already seen, rendered him all but immune to the police's small arms fire. His torso was enclosed in a Type 3A rated ballistic vest. His arms and legs were covered in Type 3A rated ballistic plates that had been cannibalized from spare bulletproof vests. Of particular note, Phillips appeared to value the health and well-being of his meat and veg particularly highly as his groin guard was reinforced substantially with extra armor plating. <laughs> in this case, I can't blame him. That, you know, that is not, not a good time. Phillips then topped his brutish ensemble with a custom-made wedding harness, which utilized surplus military canteen pouches to serve as large ammunition pouches, and just for good measure, further topped his harness with extra ballistic plating. Matt valued mobility much more than Phillips, who, as you may have guessed from the aforementioned description, preferred to be a slow but unstoppable force. Matt wore a lighter and less protective Type 2A black jacket, to which he jury-rigged an inch-thick steel trauma plate, just for good measure. Other than that, he wore no other armor. As previously seen, the armor worn by Matt and Phillips rendered them all but immune to the police's small arms fire, with pistol and shotgun rounds simply bouncing off them. The armor also provided decent protection against rifle rounds, as low pressure or decelerated 5.56 mm rounds would also simply bounce off. Holy sh these guys had so much firepower, it's absolutely mad. Casualties. When looking at particular adrenaline-inducing cases such as the North Hollywood shootout, it's easy to romanticize the events and forget the true length 
and breadth of their horrifying impact, both physical and mental, that the victims and casualties go through. Fortunately, no one besides Mats and Phillips died in today's story. Excellent! Oh, that's good news. But every single wound inflicted leaves a life irreparably damaged and a mind that will never truly rest soundly again. Combat is not sexy. It is not glamorous. It is among the most horrific things a human being can ever have to suffer through, and I pray that all of you watching and listening never have to end up on the scary side of a firearm. So with that in mind, let us take a moment to review and commemorate the full list of casualties from the North Hollywood shootout. Sergeant Dean Haynes, shot in the left shoulder as he tried to move non-combatants into cover. Finding himself pinned down and both unable to escape of his own accord or be rescued, he continued to observe and report to his comrades about the gunman's status. Officer Martin Whitfield, shot in the arm, right femur, twice in the chest. Despite being critically wounded, he refused to be rescued until the firefighter come to its conclusion and furthermore prioritized the rescue of civilians before himself. Officer Conrado Torres received a glancing shot to the right side of his neck and fortunately was left with only minor injuries. Officer James Borovan, shot twice by Matt, receiving major penetrating wounds to his back, thigh, and hip while using himself to shield a plainclothes detective, Tracy Angeles, who did not have any body armor. Detective William Krulat, shot in the right ankle. Detective Tracy Angeles received a glancing shot to the stomach. Officer Stuart Guy, forearm and femur shattered by rifle fire, tragically invalided out of the force after being unable to fully recover. Detective Earl Valadares, hit by shrapnel while taking cover behind his squad car. Officer Ed Brentlinger, shot in the left forearm and hit by concrete shrapnel after discharging 27 rounds at the gunman. Officer William Lance, shot in the right knee while attempting to evade, continued firing as Ithaca Model 37 even after being wounded. Officer John Goodman, injured by flying glass and shrapnel as the minivan he was taking cover behind was targeted by Phillips. Officer David Grimes, injured in a traffic accident as he raced in the scene of the shootout. Mildred Nolt, punched in the face and fell to the floor by Phillips in Branch 384. John Villagrana, the bank manager who Matt took to the vaults, was hit across the face by the stock of a Type 56 for supposed not compliance. Javier Orozco, assaulted by Phillips in Branch 384 when he refused to keep his place on the floor. Barry Golding, hit by shrapnel while taking cover with Sergeant Hayes during the initial shootout. Tracy Fisher, shot in the little toe as she took cover with Sergeant Hayes. Michael Horan, took a rifle round to the chest as he attempted to flee the scene. Jose Haro, owner of a locksmith opposite Branch 384, hit by shrapnel in the right arm as he hid from gunfire. Dismembered Appendices so this was a bit of a marathon wasn't it ladies and gentlemen but hopefully an interesting one there are quite a few videos already on youtube of the 20 minute general overview type on the north hollywood shootout so rather than repeating what many of you may have already seen i decided to do something a bit different with this one and give you more of an in-depth look at the actual shootout itself hopefully it wasn't too long-winded or boring i found it fascinating throughout i know it was long it doesn't seem like i've been sitting here for a, over an hour and a half at all which is, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good sign. I hope you guys liked it too. I was fortunate enough in the production of this script that a hell of a lot of very high quality amateur scholarship on the North Hollywood shootout already exists, so I'd like to extend my gratitude to everyone in that community whose collation and extensive exploration of all sources related to the shootout really expedited my process. So. Yeah, with that in mind, let's end this extremely long video. If you enjoyed this one sort of um, more, not exactly heisty, but shootouty, there's another episode which I think is kind of up, might be up your street. Uh, it's called The White Uno Gang. It's another episode we did here about a month ago, according to my little notes here, which uh, I will link to on the screen now. So if you enjoyed this one, please do check that out. If you're listening as a podcast, obviously I can't link to it. Uh, but if you go back to episode, oh, it's not listed. Oh no, it's a few episodes ago, maybe 10 episodes ago. The White Uno Gang would be worth a listen if you enjoyed today's. And thank you as always for watching or listening, and I'll see you next time.